Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash, which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma. And in this video, we are going to be kicking off my long in-depth series on the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. So this is an army I'm personally very excited about, obviously. It's the newest death army at this moment in time. We may have some vampires come out soon, but at the moment it is the one army for Age of Sigma that is a death army that I haven't really built too much of yet. So I've got some stuff built. I'm going to be painting a lot of stuff, so I'm very motivated personally with this army to do this long in-depth army review. And in this particular video, we are going to be starting off by talking about their lore. So before we go into all the rules and all that sort of thing, it's important that we understand who they are, and it is at least for me, as the law and the story for my armies and everything in Age of Sigma is half the fun to me, just as much fun as actually playing them on the table. And I do always start these series by talking about the army story, and if you're interested in more uh, faction lore, go check out my playlist I have on that. The last ones I did were for Slaves of Darkness and the Beasts of Chaos. So before we get started in this video, I just want to do a massive shout out to my patrons, as they are the lifeblood of this channel, so that's going to be my fantastic and loyal Morgos. So that's going to be Sandback, Jonathan H, Phil Cohen Bleed Red, my Vampires, which is Mir, Martin S, Rouse321, and David A, and then my Necromancers, which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wamba, Christopher F, and Christopher C. Guys, thank you all so much for your continued support. It really means the world to me. If any of you would like to become a Patreon and support the channel, you'll find a link to my Patreon down below at the top of the description. You can click if you'd like to give anything, even a dollar a month really does go to support the channel. If you can't do that, but you enjoy the content, make sure you smash that like button and subscribe button, that bell notification if you haven't. But anyway, with all that out of the way, let us get on. And I want to actually start by doing a reading from the Battle Tome to really get us set into the mood of the Irish Bone Reapers before we go into what exactly are they, how are they made, how do they fit into the overall realms as a whole and also their history. So the reading goes, the Osiarch Bone Reapers come forth in macabre splendour, for they are Nagash's will given form. All that they kill becomes theirs, body and soul. There is a way to keep these undead horrors from the gates, to keep their nadrite blades from sinking into living flesh. It is an option the Osirach leaders take pains to outline in dry, sepulchral tones, negotiating with their victims-to-be in a morid mockery of a parley. The heart turns cold as the true horror of their proposal becomes clear. By giving on to them a sufficient offering of bone, the Osirach Empire can be held at bay, but only for a time. This is a military force like no other. It is organised and efficient to a supernatural degree, led by generals created by Nagash himself, and lent a measure of necromantic power for time immemorial. The legions of the Bone Reapers lay dormant underground, standing serried in hidden catacombs created when Nagash and Sigma had still called one another allies. Now with the echoes of the Necroquake invigorating their deathly forms, they march to war by the thousands. At their fore is Catacross, Mortark of the Necropolis, an undying strategic genius whose centuries-long existence has been turned towards perfecting the art of war. The Osirach Bone Reapers exist to conquer. They seek nothing less than to craft a new order from the bones of the old. Those who fail to meet their tithe, whether through choice or necessity, face a terrible fate. They will be relentlessly torn apart, their flesh sorted, from the skeleton and their body from the soul, until they become nothing more than raw materials. Then from their remains, from the very essence of who they once were, new bone reapers will be made. This is the terrible truth of the Osiarchs. 
They turn their victims into more of their kind, and like death itself, they cannot be stopped. So now that we know just how terrifying the force of the Osterich Bone Reapers are, I will explain to you exactly what type of creatures they are, and what I will say is that you may hear me refer to the Osterich Bone Reapers in different names, and that's just so I'm not repeating the full title again. So it could be like the Osterich Empire or Ossi Arch, or it could just be Bone Reapers, anything like that. I'm just referring to them and just sort of shortening down the name as and wherefore. What I would also like to say is I have actually done lore videos on the name characters of the Ostrich Bone Reapers all separately. So if you'd like to go check that out for more detail in case you're wondering uh, why I haven't mentioned so much about them in this video, there's your answer. So what essentially are the Ostrich Bone Reapers? Now they are necromantic constructs made of bone and soul. Each soldier is not simply the reincarnation of one soul and one skeleton but a combination of multiple souls and skeletons. These souls are also molded into the personalities to reflect the trait and skill that the Osherwatch Empire requires and are stripped of non-required feelings such as compassion, love, mercy and fear. This results in the perfect soldier required for the long continuous war ahead. Unlike more traditional animated undead, Nagash allows each Bone Reaper to have a slice of their own will to help them in battle. And Nagash has purged all the souls used of any trait of cowardice or fear to ensure they will never flee a battle and will die to achieve whatever task Nagash has created them for. This also makes them very self-dependent and do not always have to rely on their leaders to get the job done. The amount and types of souls and bones required for each construct will differ determined of their role. The Mortec Guard, for example, who form the shield backbone and bulk of the Osherach Bone Reapers, will often be made of two to three souls and skeletons, chosen from the souls, most defensive and regimental warriors who have fallen to the Osherach Bone Reapers. Whereas the Cavalos Death Riders are made from the greatest cavalier and knights, and their Cavalos mounts are interestingly made from not horse remains, but the great beasts of the realms. For example, one of the Cavalos' souls could be the soul of a Stonehorn from the Ogamore tribes, or the soul of a Karkadrak from the Slaves to Darkness. This also is the same for the Cavalos' bones and can be seen when you look upon one and see its head reflect the beast it has been forged from. And this is something you can see very often. You'll see there'll be ones such as have a like a bird skull or they'll have an alligator skull or there's ones with a sort of like a more demonic appearance and there's money more as well and it's just like a really nice cool aesthetic and for me personally that's why I think they're a really cool looking unit especially the model terms as well and lore as well it's lovely right imagine the idea of just like a more crusher soul being part of a, this animated bone construct of a horse right just brilliant brilliant stuff and allows so much customization for if you want to do conversions and all that sort of thing just gives you loads to play with it then if we were to talk about the liege caveos who are the leaders of the Osterwatch legions will be made from the most determined and tactical leaders who have lived. This means the generals of the Osherarch Bone Reapers have no weaknesses to be exploited and plan for any potential outcome in a battle. And what I think is really cool about this is that let's say you had an army that was fighting against the Osherarch Bone Reapers and they did a really good job to try and beat the Bone Reapers or just to hold them back. However, eventually the army is defeated. The great general from the army that's came out of all these strategies to try and beat the Osherarch Bone Reapers, now the Osherarch Bone Reapers are going to use the intelligence and commanding skills of his soul against any future enemies by making him and well, his, con his materials really, his bones and his soul, become part of the Osherich Empire, which I think is really cool and you can see how it can play there. And that's why like the Liege Cavalosses can be so good because they can be made of like three really, really tactical generals as an example. So that's just like an example of some of the ones I've came up with for the Osherich Bone Reapers. Again, I'm going to go into individual lore for each unit when I review them and the rules and everything in later videos as part of, like I say, this long in-depth army series. But I thought those three units are a good example to give you a little taster of what 
they're like and how it actually all works. So now that we know what the ostrich bone reapers are and how they are created, the next question is where does all this mass resource of souls and bones come from? So firstly, the souls come from either straight from the gaseous collection, essentially, you know, his little money jar, his little money pot, because he has so many souls that are all drawn to him, you know, in the realm of death and Shaish, obviously. Or they also come from directly from defeated foes of the Ostrich Bone Reapers in battle. And that's like I was saying with that like Liege Cavios example there. And this is one of the main roles of the Mortison Soul Reaper. So that is one of the wizards for the Ostrich Bone Reapers. Again, we'll go into more lore about it when we review it. But essentially what he is, he's the one, if you've seen the model, he's one of the wizards. He's like the most basic wizard if you like, but he's got like this big uh, scythe. And his role is to reap the souls needed to keep on empowering this seamlessly unstoppable Osiarch war machine. And like I say, we'll review individual units and we'll talk about their lore in another video. But it just gives you an idea of how every single part of the Osiarch Bone Reapers has a purpose. There's no dead weight if you like, because all the dead here is just going to fucking slaughter you. So that is essentially how the Osiarch Empire gather their souls needed to, like I say, keep them fuel on that war machine. However, it is actually the collection of the resource of the bones where things get interesting as everyone's vying for souls, right, in Age of Sigma. If you're not vying for souls, then you're not keeping up with the Joneses. You're not keeping up with the latest fashion of what's hot to do in the mortal realms if you're not collecting souls. So everyone's doing that. That's fine. But when it comes to bones and skeletal remains, apart from skulls going to corn, there's not a massive, uh, and you know, I suppose like, the Carrion Empires, the Flesh Eater Courts, you know, they like to gnaw on the bones. But apart from that, there's not really a massive need for it. And it's often seen as a waste product of the Soul Wars, which I think is always important to be really, really keen on recycling and getting the ultimate maximum out of your kill. And where the Ostrich Bone Reapers actually generate a lot of their resource of bones from is going to be from what is known as as the Tithe of Bones, which is when the incredibly cold accountant's intelligence of the Osharach Bone Reapers is demonstrated so brilliantly. As when they expand into a new area, they will construct what is called a Bone Tithe Nexus, which is essentially their scenery piece you see on the table, and it is a terrifying monument that is saturated in Shaishian death magic, and is the location where the Tithe of Bones is paid. Then when the Osirish Bone Reapers come into contact with most other civilizations, be it a village, township, city, kingdom, or even a great empire, and everything in between, they will not declare war, but instead will wait at the front of any such civilization and demand for diplomatic negotiations, backed by an overwhelming force. With all the grandiose of a chance for talks of equal value, the Osirish Bone Reapers will only offer one pact, being the tithe of bones. This is a contract that states the civilization must repeatedly pay a certain amount of bones to the Osirish Empire. The amount of bones that must be supplied will vary on the civilization. For example, a village may only have to annually supply four chests of bones, and a great empire may have to supply 70 cartloads of bones on an annual basis. Most civilizations will accept this deal, and the example I want to sort of give to you now of what I came up with, which happens all the time in the mortal realms, is that of a village who will look out at the dreaded force in front of them and think, what chance do we have to stand against them? But then you hear, instead of being slaughtered, that is option one, option two is that the Ostrich Bone Reapers just want a one-sided trade agreement and do not wish to slaughter you. They'd rather you go for the deal than any sort of villager will happily sign away in a heartbeat to that deal, going, hey, this is great, isn't it? We thought we were all going to die, and now it turns out we're all going to live. Fantastic. And then they'll start by emptying their graveyards to pay the tithe first. Like, oh, we just get them all. Dig up the graves. I know that's disrespectful to the dead, but dig up the graves. It's better than us being dead as well. We'll just give them these bones we have no use for. Everyone's a winner, right? We live. They get their tithe, their deal, whatever they want to do, the weird bone guys. We get to survive. However, 
Let's say six years later, when the graveyard lies empty, the dawning realization will become clear to the villagers that they do not have enough bones to pay the tithe, and they will have to resort to more brutal ways to pay the tithe, which could be a collective effort where everyone simply cuts off three of their fingers, three of their toes, you know, whatever they fancy. Or maybe a lottery system where the unlucky few must be sacrificed to save the many. However, year on year, the horror intensifies to breaking point. Then on the yearly day, the tithe must be paid. The now weakened, crippled and few in number villagers cannot survive and pay the tithe of bones, meaning they have broken this most sacred pact and will now face the slaughter they once thought they could escape. And this is the same story for all the civilizations that sign the tithe, just escalated to their size. Like I said earlier, this shows the intelligence of the accountancy of the Osirich Bone Reapers as simply put, they know it is better to farm these civilizations for their bones and souls rather than a quick win. As the Bone Reapers reflect that all is Nagash and are all about the long war and victory. As they are the dead and time is always on their side. This allows the Osirich Bone Reapers to be able to effectively and reliably plan their construction of new soldiers and the expansion of their empire. Essentially... Put in our terms, like having an annual income, isn't it? If you just get like random donations to try and keep you alive, let's say, in the existence of our world, uh, it's quite hard to plan things. But if you manage to have an annual income, you can, you know, plan future things. And like, that's how you can bring it to a real world society of what we can all relate to. Because the Osirich Bone Reapers don't look at it and go, like I say, the quick winner just going, oh, there's civilization there, knock into the ground, harvest them all. There we go, boom, we've got some troops. It's like, no, but in this point in 300 years from now, we may have insufficient numbers because we were reckless here and we just wanted the quick victory. That's not how death generally plays and certainly not for us bone reapers. They are there for the long war. Even if they suffer a defeat, it may be for a future planned event. And that's not like Zeech is in like, oh, just as planned. It's like, no, the Osirish Bone Reapers had this strategy in place and it's all about forward thinking. So I think that's really, really clever and I really do like it. So now that I talked about the fate of those who signed the Tiger Bones, however, there are those who are foolish enough or either have the foresight to foresee the Tiger Bones is a death sentence. These civilizations will make a stand against the Osirich Bone Reapers and will say no to their tithe. As brave as this all is, it will just quicken their death. As when the tithe of bones is rejected, the Osirich have given these civilizations a chance to survive and they have chosen their fate. The full might of the Bone Reapers will descend upon them without mercy and will spare no one, for if there is no tithe, they will slaughter the disobedient cattle now. Which I completely agree with. They were given a chance, and they chose their fate poorly. Right, so now I actually want to talk about their history for the Ostrich Bone Reapers. So we're going to go over the Age of Myth, we're going to go over the Age of Chaos, and then we'll talk about, you know, the Age of Sigma and where we are now. And also what we're going to do, rather than this just being a really long video on the history of the Ostrich Bone Reapers, and I don't want to ruin it for yourselves and stuff, we're just going to zoom in on key points that happened, right? So going off the Age of Myth, Nagash firstly is freed from his incarceration in Shaish, the realm of death, by Sigma. Then Nagash consumes all other gods of Shaish to ensure he is rightfully, I will add, the only lord of undeath. Nagash then goes and joins Sigma in the Pantheon of Order, which actually isn't just about the Order gods we think about now. It's not just your elves and everything like that. They're elven gods. They has actually got Sigma, obviously, dwarven gods, elven gods, Nagash has also got Gorkamorka in it as well, so there's quite a few, and they join at different dates and everything else. But when Nagash joins, he actually helps the forces of order um, be able to build many cities across all of the mortal realms. With his countless skeletons working relentlessly with the humans, elves, and dwarves, 
However, unknown to the other races, Nagash ensures his skeletons dig under as many cities as possible to build catacombs so deep that no living creature could survive. And this is particularly um, potent in Shaish, where obviously if you go straight too far away from the center of the realms, that can also be by just digging under, you're going to become more saturated in death magic, which means living creatures are going to have a hard time staying alive, right? Also in the Age of Myth, within Nagash's citadels and laboratories, he uses dark necromantic energy on a scale that has not been seen until that date, and is able to split the souls from the bodies of some of his most powerful necromancers. Nagash then splits the souls again, removing any signs of weakness or disloyalty. He then places these souls into bone constructs, creating the first of the Osharach Bone Reapers and the Mortisans. Nagash then gives these Mortisans only one sole purpose, to create an army worthy of Nagash, turning scraps of bones into the Osirach Empire that will conquer the entire realms. And then this is also when Nagash started to make different Osirach Bone Reaper legions to fit a different purpose, such as the Petrofit Elite, the Mortis Praetorians, the Noel Murad, all these different ones will cover their own lore in a different video. When we go into the army videos, like I said, we're going to cover the unit lore. We're also going to cover the legions laws when we review them. However, I thought it was interesting that it's actually in the Age of Myth we started doing this. And you may ask yourself, you know, why, if he was making them all now, why is it taking them this long to get to the Age of Sigma and later in the Age of Sigma to release the Osirach Bone Reapers? And that's simply because Nagash knew they were not ready. So then the further we go in to the Age of Myth, tensions then grow between most of the dead and the living in Shaish, as the dead see the living either as unwelcome guests or invaders, who do not treat the realm of death with the respect and are all a blight on the sacred realm of the dead, because quite simply, a lot of the dead see as if the living aren't going to treat this place as respect, they don't even belong here, right? Shaish is for Arthalize, is for the dead. They should be really grateful they're here, and if they're not, then maybe it's time we got rid of them. Then moving on to when the Age of Chaos began, war broke out between the forces of order and death. Sigma invaded Shaish and fought Catacross, the Mortarch of the Necropolis and the leader of the Osirach Bone Reapers, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Although Catacross battled Sigma for many hours and demonstrated his skill of a warrior, he could not hope to best a god. Sigma, having struck down Catacross, realised he could not fully kill him, and known he had to fall back to Azir to escape the numberless legions of chaos. Sigma imprisoned Catacross in the storm vault in the Shaish city of Alephus, which I believe that is how it is pronounced. But with not being able to hold back the forces of chaos either, Nagash is forced to retreat to the Shaish underworld of Stygix to heal his physical form and to gather his strength. And then zooming out and zooming back in and going into the Age of Sigma, this is when Sigma now completed his work of the Stormcast Eternals, releasing them upon the mortal realms to push back the armies of the Dark Gods. However, when the Stormcast of the Storm Host, known as the Anvil of the Heldenhammer, enters Shaish, Nagash senses the soul forging of Sigma has achieved and is pushed to new heights of anger knowing that Sigma the traitor has and is still stealing souls that rightfully belong to Nagash. Then let's skip forward through the Age of Sigma. Nagash's and his most trusted Morsark Arkan the Black's great work was near an exaggeration point, which has now been known and been titled as the Shaishan Necroquake. This was using skeletons to travel to the edge of the realm of death, to gather the Shaiish realm stone known as Gravesand, and to bring it back to the construction known as the Black Pyramid. The plan was to use the Black Pyramid to wield all this saturated death magic and to turn it into a shockwave of death magic that would wipe out most life in the mortal realms. However, the masters of espionage being the Skaven from Clan Eshin, managed to enter the Black Pyramid 
and their chaotic presence made the power of the Black Pyramid unstable and caused it to explode and come crashing down to the ground. This resulted in not Nagash's planned effects, but instead the shockwave of death magic spread across the mortal realms and caused the fringes of life and death to shift, creating the race we know today as the Night Haunt, who lash out and enact a war of terror onto the living. The Necroquake also made the balance of magic in the mortal realms unbalanced, and this is when we saw the rise of endless and predatory spells. The Night Haunt, now led by Lady Alinda, the Mortarch of Grief, assault the city of Lephus and free Catacross from his Storm Vault prison. Catacross then returned to Nagash's capital in Nagashazar and has slaughtered any living creature he comes across to take out his bottled, now unfettered fury of his unjustified imprisonment by Sigma. Upon arriving at Nagashazar, his soul is given a new construct to possess. Now remade, Catacross leads his Oshrush Bone Reaper legions across the mortal realms, much to the suffering of all the other Grand Alliances who are still struggling against the Night Haunt. This is Nagash's plan to have all the other races on the back foot from the Night Haunt, then to knock them down by the Osirach Bone Reapers. Catacross has even invaded the Eight Points, home to Archaeon the Ever Chosen, and the forces of chaos in the mortal realms. Although Catacross was pushed back, the Osirach Empire still has a foothold in the Eight Points. And then I'm really going to tie that back to what I said earlier about how death in general, obviously undeath being pretty much all to the will of Nagash, and obviously including the Osirach Bone Reapers, Catacross here for example, wasn't actually planning to take the eight points in that one strike. When you read the story from that, it's from the Wrath of the Everchosen book, and it's fantastic, uh, really cool, some battles in there, it's really, really good. And what you find out is essentially, I mean, I was going to say no spoilers, but the book's been out now for a year, so, you know, you can read it yourself by now, basically. But essentially, Cash Cross gets beaten by Archaon, and then when Cash Cross goes back to... Shaish and is given a uh, basically his soul was being given a new construct again to possess. Turns out they've actually replicated many of Catacross's new constructs to possess. So they've made lots of spare bodies for him for when he dies, and they did that going into the eight points. So they knew that they weren't going to win and actually be able to take control of the eight points. But the reason why they did that is just to test Archaon's defenses. And also, as a big part of this, Archaon was going to try and free Sonesh. And he had to abandon that to go save the eight points. So there was also a play in it there. And you might go, what's the immediate gain from this? There might not be a huge immediate gain. But when you look in, I don't know, a thousand years from now, in obviously the Mortal Realms, it could be a huge part of Nagash's plan. That was done then, and then you'll see it unfold later in the narrative. And I really like that long-term thinking. It goes from anything from like the bone types, what we talked about earlier, to this when it comes to war and combat. So now that we've covered their history and everything else, I sort of want to wrap this up now. And I'm going to talk about why are the Ostrich Bone Reapers cool. And the reason I think why they're cool, if you look at them from a lore perspective, is they are Nagash's endgame. They are his ace card he is playing, right? If you look at things like the Necroquake, where at first you think, oh, this is his game, this is his play, right? To try and wipe out a lot of life in the Mortal Realms by doing this bomb, essentially, to go off. Turns out that was only a way to accelerate his actual master plan, which is why I said accelerate when I mentioned the Necroquake, because that wasn't his end game. The Ostrich Bone Reapers are, and the Necroquake was just to wipe out a lot of people, and then that's so many more souls and uh, bones to harvest all one go. And I know that sort of sounds like, oh, isn't that just like a quick win? And we talked about how you shouldn't really go for those as Osher Bone Reapers, they think ahead. Yeah, but if you wipe out, I don't know, 75% of all life in the mortal realms, 
you don't need to think ahead too much because you've managed to achieve everything you were going to think ahead to try and achieve for already, if that makes sense. And I really like that because it's one of those things, isn't it, where you think, poor, that Necker quake, that was like the biggest thing Nagash could come up with. Ha ha, no, that was actually just basically a step up to what he wanted to achieve here with the Ultra Bone Reapers. So I think that's really cool. The Ultra Bone Reapers are the Nagash's dream, right? It's his skeleton hordes, but they've actually been refined and made to his idea of perfection. And some people even said that they were the Death Stormcast. That's absolute hoppycock, because obviously they are a hell of a lot cooler than Stormcast Eternals, 100%. And then the other thing I think is cool, and you see it reflected on the table, it's just like their sense of discipline and how strategic they are within the game and within warfare. I think it's fantastic. Then when you see it on the tabletop, like each unit has a command ability it can do, and like basically the champion of like the Mortec Guard, for example, is almost in himself a hero, and it just works really nicely, and it just synergizes really well. And that is why I'm going to start actually using it in games on TTS uh, at some point shortly in the future, and really get to use them. I play them in a mini tournament I had on the channel on the Discord. Join the Discord if you like to with that, and. It was really good fun. Uh, it was only a two game tournament, but it was uh, it was quite good. It had like an all cavalry army and it actually worked pretty well. So I'm really excited to start this long series going to do on the Ostrich Bone Reapers. I hope you are as well. If you've got any questions or anything like that about the Ostrich Bone Reapers or you're excited for it, just to hear your thoughts on them, please put down in the comments down below. It'd be awesome to hear that. I always like um, chatting to you guys about armies I'm really passionate about. And also, if you're wondering like a little bit more lore, like, what about... Um, Catacross or what about Vokmortian or what about you know Xantos I have done lore videos on those guys and I've even done one on Arkan the Black as well he's part of the army so you can go check that out separately if you'd like to in the Ostrich Bone Reaper uh, playlist for sure but with that guys all I'm going to say is thank you very much for watching this video if you did enjoy it please smash that like button that subscribe button and that bell notification if you haven't already all three of those things are a huge way to support the channel and the best thing is they're free to do so and also if you did find this video useful and you think someone else may please share the video with them because i'm really happy to and i want to get people inspired by the law in age of sigma especially when it comes to death so i'll be really happy to help them out there and now it's going to be time for me to do a shout out to the absolute legends who are my patrons honestly you guys do a fantastic job you really support the channel on a huge matter. I always say that you guys are the reason why I can continue doing this. So that's going to be my amazing Morgas, which are going to be Sam Back and Jonathan H and Phil Kerr and Bleed Red. Guys, that's here. I honestly, like I always say, I don't know what to say. Thank you much for your continued support. You guys alone really, really do make a huge difference. And then we've got my vampires, who again do a fantastic job, which are going to be Mir, and Martin S, Rouse321 and David A. And of course my Necromancers, which are going to be Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wombat, Christopher F and Christopher C and Ronnie H as well, which I'd like to say may not appear at the start of the video. But that's because while well, during this time of me making it, Ronnie has become a patron, so thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate your support to the channel. Please keep it up. And, of course, I know there's been other people who have uh, joined my Patreon lately, and thank you to all you people and everyone, of course, who's been supporting me on Patreon for a while. Huge shout-out. And what I will say as well, if you would like to become one of those people and really do become the reason of why I can continue this channel, please consider donating on the Patreon. You'll find a link to it at the top of the description down below. Even if you just gave $1 a month, guys, it makes a huge difference to the channel. But with that aside, I'm just going to thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And remember until next time to stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, stay hygienic, so we will start game again soon. Special Ostrich Bone Reapers. And of course, more importantly, until next time, remember that Nagash is all, and all is one in Nagash. <laughs>